Uh, hey everybody, how are you doing? It's Ryan, uh, Chef Ryan Donahue, the Power Systems here in Buffalo, New York. Doing our normal Tuesday demo thing. Hey, Chris Harvey. Um, sorry about last week, we were uh, a little in the weeds here. Um, trying to do a, a train to somebody about 2,000 miles away on Zoom and just it was too for Cobra Plus, so we thought we'd take a week off. Thanks for uh, coming back anyway. Um, so as we're all, we're doing both the Instagram feed and the Facebook feed. Uh, and I can't leave the screen because it's so far away from me unless I lean over when I do it. So in my ear is usually my friend Mike. Wow, Tom Bauer from Belgium just tuned in. Um, this week is my friend Catherine from our sales team. You may know her from your custom mold projects or other things that we've talked to about here. Uh, so she's going to feed me questions while this is going on and let me know if you guys have questions. So please ask lots of questions. We're going to try to fly through making a praline in 45 minutes. I'm going to make the mash. I'm going to color the molds. I'm going to shell mold. I'm going to pipe the molds. I'm going to cap the molds. I'm going to knock the molds out. We're going to try to do that in 45 minutes. And look at that cat, Chris Harvey, saying hello to you on Instagram. So like you, like you barely said hi to me, so you're more popular than I am. Hey, a couple of quick things that like I need to remember. They, they joke with me that I look like a NASCAR guy right here, and I don't know if you don't know where it's a hack for everything just every time I do a demo. Um, this week I wanna I'm wearing a hat from Calio. Calio is our provider of all of our uniform apparel here at Comic, a really great company out of Rochester. And also I'm gonna give props and we'll try to use them later. I have edible luster. Food grade edible luster candor, candorin from my friends at Centerpen. So, Valerie, thank you for sending me all this. I've been promising we're going to be using it for a little while. Um, I'm going to try to use it today if we have time, but Kat's going to remind me that like, I probably don't have time because we're going to have to fly through this. So, the goal today is we're not going to really talk much about recipe. We are going to make a ganache. We're going to talk a little bit about the process. Um, but I make it a straightforward one to one. Uh, dark chocolate ganache, what I make. Um, so I've got 500 grams here of cream. For those of you who are listening, that was loud. Wasn't that nice and careful? Yeah. Um, so the, the first part of this process, I'm going to make ganache. I'm starting with my ganache because I need it to cool before I go to put it in my, in my pieces, or in my, in my shelf over here. We're going to do a hard roll today. Um, and we're going to do that technique that I showed a couple weeks ago of sort of a two-tone using black. And we'll get to that when we get to it. Um, so it's a one-to-one -one ganache. I'm heating my cream right now. And we're going to get, get, get up. And then we're going to, we're going to combine those things. So that's the first question. How do I combine those things? I have three tools in front of me. I have a version blender. I have a whisk, and I have a rubber spatula. Um, I've decided to turn them loose, and, and I bring this up because we were setting the demo before, and um, Beth, my assistant, was here a little earlier, and she was making the notch, and her initial reaction to the notch was, was the wire whisk, where I'm more of a rubber spatula guy. The trick here is that we don't want to break it, whatever we do, right? And some of that is about technique, and some of that is also going to be about um, Back my recipe. Right. My recipe here, you know, I'm using a 36% cream ish. Um, the fat in my in my chocolate is about 37%. So we're keeping it under 40. So I'm and Bob says hello. Hi Bob. Hey, so I need to pop the cork on my on my uh, bottle of rum. Uh, to have a drink, by the way, so we probably all need it today. I'm going to set a little bit of rum to my gosh. I'm doing this mostly because it's got a ton of vanilla flavor in my one. So my cream is starting to seep, or steep, not seep. Maybe I was drinking a little bit of rum earlier. So I'm going to take it off. I'm actually going to pour it directly over the top of Catherine says a little stuff in this too. So that aroma to get for me is that a really nice little aroma. Um, and I'm going to let that sit for a moment. The other thing, too, with my ganache is generally what I do 
It's sitting up on a towel. It's sitting up on a towel because I don't want it to lose its heat right now. My marble is cold. My marble is about 68 degrees. Okay, so I'm starting in the center with small concentric circles. Did I say that right? I don't even know. And I'm, and I'm beginning to, you know, formulate for my emulsion. Right. As they begin to mix together, I'm going to come back with my original letter. So for those of you who can't hear me now, you're really not going to be able to hear me. So my original letter on. And there's not a ton of gas here, so I'm just being careful that I don't splatter my filling everywhere. Catherine's asking me a question. So somebody had a question. Fire away, Catherine. Can you run Ganache from the EX? So the question is the machine behind it, which actually is not the machine in question, but is it some company that, whether or not we can run Ganache through there? Um, you can. It depends on the viscosity. If you have like a little chocolate, Remember also that you, um, there's some microbiological concerns, so you've got to do a nice job of cleaning it out. So in that case, like the Zone is a better solution, but you can never, I mean, you can have a ganache. The ganache I made right here, probably not, just because the viscosity is pretty thick, but, you know, as you formulate, it's really about, about your viscosity. So hopefully that answers the question. And I bet you that's Tyler who's asking that question. So anyway, so all I'm doing is I'm making sure that um, all my cream and all my chocolate are completely emulsified. Also, I don't know if you didn't notice for this recipe, I didn't add any additional sugars. Um, so there's no tripling, there's nothing else in here because I'm not really worried about shelf life. I'm not really worried about um, anything else. All I'm really worried about is getting a ganache for it. So that was it. And then Catherine was about to ask me another question. I'm going to cut it off. So she's going to ask a question. So the question is about the digital handheld thermometer I'm using, because many seem inaccurate. So this one is a Home Depot special from Ryobi. Now, about inaccuracy, keep in mind it's only taking a surface temperature. Okay? The farther away you get from whatever you're taking the temperature off, the wider the spread of the infrared, right? Okay, so my gosh is really pretty. It's, it's shiny. I'll show it to you in a second once I'm done talking. Once I get this unplugged, so I don't make a mess. Um, so if I hold this thermometer right here, my gosh is at 140 degrees. If I come farther up, right, the spread's wider and it actually drops the temperature. Right. So really, it's about how you use it. If we're really interested in getting an accurate temperature of the picture of what the temperature of something is. We've got to go in the middle of it, right? And the only way to do that is with a probe thermometer. So that's part of the challenge with it. A couple weeks ago, we tempered on the marble here, and I use it to as a baseline, but I don't use it as an end all be all for temperature because it won't be accurate. It, it definitely won't be accurate. Okay, so we're at 104 degrees. I definitely can't pipe this right now into a shell. If I were to pipe this into a shell right now, I would break the temper, right? So I'm going to set that aside. Normally, what I'll do with a bigger bowl is I've got, you know, five kilos, we'll take a sheet of plastic wrap, we'll stick it directly into the notch, and we look at that skin or that, that, that awfulness at the top, right? and we set it aside. Also, I don't know if you noticed, I took it off my towel so that it's cooling from the marble a little bit. Okay, so, I've got a list over here, make the notch, check. If you have questions about that, we can come back to it too. So the next step is gonna be Airbrushing it. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do color cocoa butter. I'm going to do actually um, three applications today. I'm going to apply red into my cavities. I'm then going to do a topical application. I'm going to do black, and I'm going to spray the whole thing together. And we'll we'll show you how we do this. Okay. So in my hot box, I have my color cocoa butter, which again, look, I'm placing on a towel. All right. 
and I tempered this earlier using uh, silk cocoa butter, right? So I blended the cocoa butter in with uh, the colored cocoa butter. My cocoa butter was about 93 degrees. I've added about 3% of all the ice in the measure, but it's got enough. Um, in fact, the way that I did it here was I have a popsicle. I pull a little bit of cocoa butter off out of the jar, out of the container, and I'm adding it to my colored cocoa butter. So what this is doing for me is it's ensuring that my butter is in temper. All right? Just end up throw this out. So that it's in good condition to spray, but also still in really good temper. So what it allows me to do is it allows me to spray a little warmer temperature. So 90, 90-ish, 91 degrees in the 30 degree world, right? And then I still need good coverage. Because I get asked this question a lot, um, I use a lot of compressors. I use Badger airbrushes. So it's an Awada Quick Check, I think. Smart Check, sorry. Um, it's got a little tank, so it's nice. And my air today is set at around 50 PSI. Okay. So I always want to spray away from my bowl first, just to make sure that I'm getting the results that I want. My kit got a little cold, not a big deal, just pour some little color through it. And so it's a little cold. Normally what I would do is I could hit that with a, with a heat gun or an airbrush, or a heat gun or a hair dryer. No questions, just blind fumbling on this. That's all right. So we're just putting some red in. All right. So, I don't know if you can see, but I hold this up. We will see it better than we have gold. There's like two different colors on that mold, right? With a pretty clear with a pretty clear line between those two things. And again, this is something that we showed a couple weeks ago, is I'm just going to use a little bit of scotch tape and split that mold in half. I'm leaving the tape over the edges so I'll be able to pull this off easily. So, Apparently our marketing manager is asking where you can get good color cocoa butter because he's just got to be like that. And uh, we use, here's the top of the kitchen. We use all of our butters from Choco Butter and those are available from Power System. Okay. But they're a great company too, they're our best. So you can order direct from them, you know, if you need to on the West Coast, you can order from us other places as well. All right, we carry their full line of cocoa butter. Uh, Okay, so I have another sprayer set up with my black, in this case. Uh, I think it's infrared. Somebody asked what color the red was. I, infrared, probably. I'll look. I'll see you there in a minute. Let's see how we're doing with time. So I'm going to come in. And now I'm... See, Captain just where the time was, which is why I was the time. I would say, see how we're doing the time at the end to see if we can like, get the, if we have the red. So, what I've done is now, I really like black and red, it gives a really nice sort of wood, deep finish. And by doing it this way, I'm able to remove my tape. I'll be right back, I promise. I'm able to remove my tape, I get a pretty clear line between those two colors. Okay. So, another big question. How do I get the color cocoa butter off there? I can wait 
until it sets and scrape. Or I can come along and I can wipe that off. Usually we use paper towels for that, but then we get a nice clean mold. Um, in particular, we want to make sure that the molds are getting cleaned before using white chocolate, right? Because it will stain, uh, it'll stain the, the white chocolate quickly. The dark of the day, I'm not as worried about it, but I still want to be careful. Okay. So my last application is going to be white. And again, I know my butters are in temper because I was using them about an hour ago. Normally I would have seeded these with a little bit of my cocoa butter and my salt. So the last application, I'm just going into the bowls with a little bit of white. Okay. And that's just so that those colors pop really well when I move over to my dark chocolate. And I'm going to do the same process that I did with that black to get the color off the front top of my lips. Okay. Wow. Hey, Donna. I didn't hear you. Donna. So, for those of you who don't know, I've got somebody in my ear telling me what's going on. And she told me that Donna's here. She told me something else I didn't hear. So, hi, Donna. Cool. All right. So, how long do I let this set? I'm going to let this set until the, crystal, the, the cocoa butter crystallizes in All right? So, if I'm working in sequence, you know, normally I'd have like five or ten molds, I wouldn't have a problem. Today I do. So, I have a mold that I did about an hour ago. Look at that, Chris Paul is here. Chris Paul is the king of color cocoa butter. He's way better than me. But anyway, so we're here, right? We've got our molds. So we're ready to shell mold it. All right, I'm just playing with my glass a little bit over here. I'm seeing how the texture is doing. All right, we're down to like 95 degrees. I think it's going to work. Catherine, I think it's going to work. I think we're going to be good. All right, also, look, Chris Kohler's always laughing at me. So Catherine just told me that Chris Kohler's laughing at me, and I said that Chris Kohler's always laughing at me. I don't need to repeat what I said. Can you look at that? And he says that he loves me. That's sweet. So, I'm messing with this ganache right now. I'm doing it on purpose because I'm trying to cool it off. Normally, we don't want to, we don't want to mess with our ganache. Once we build that emulsion, we, want, we build that emulsion, we're building a crystal structure, similar to what we're doing with chocolate. I don't want to mess with it. I don't want to break those crystals because I want there to be that, that structure, okay? So, once we get it together, leave it alone until you're ready to put it in your piping tank and then you deposit it. Okay, so, next step, I need shells, I need a cavity. So, again, we did this process a couple weeks ago um, on one of these demos that I pictured in our YouTube page right now, where I did this a couple ways. I did it out of a bowl, I did it out of a pepper unit. I'm doing it out of a pepper unit today just because it's easier and faster. I'm also using the smallest of the seven pepper units, the 10 kg model. So, doesn't really matter, right? So, a couple things that are going to be hard to show in terms of the back on you, all right? My goal is I want to get all the chocolate off to this end to avoid making a mess, all right? If I get chocolate everywhere, it's hard to keep that whole thing. I can't put it down, all right? Um, the question just got asked to temper my ganaches before I fill them. Sometimes. I definitely do it when I'm I'm on the guitar. When I'm making a slab ganache, I always temper my chocolate, or temper my ganaches. I temper with the silk, like I did before. I'm using uh, an easy temper here, which I just unplugged when I pulled it over. But this is what I use for my silk. There's a couple other ones in the marketplace, but um, Carrie, Carrie and I are pretty good friends, so I've been Carrie for a long time, and so she just left the road. So that's the machine that we're using. Um, now I'm going to put it back in so that my cocoa butter is just left. It's going to beep at me and be unhappy with me because I plugged it. Um, on this ganache, you know what? I didn't, though I kind of do, right? The process where I'm heating my chocolate and I'm pulling my chocolate to a certain degree gets it to be able to set. Like, I piped these shells 
don't know if that is. 2.15. I piped these, I piped these shells like two and a half hours ago, and they're pretty firm without the refrigerator. But also, that's also a product of this recipe that has so much stock in it, right? Um, so, anyway, so I'm going to fill this. Bear with me. I'll be right back. I'll be on the next step. Okay, I, so Catherine just asked me if, you, if somebody asked for a cellular model. This is a cellular one. It's the smallest of the cellulies. It's a, it's a 10 k machine. 10 k machine. But fundamentally, they all work the same way. It's about, it's about size and volume. So for most of the projects that we work on, it's uh, not necessarily a big enough machine, but for this exercise, it's great. My biggest complaint about it is that the, the deck is the table is small, but the temper, the temper is great. So I'm Phil, I'm going to vibrate. So get a bit louder. So for all of you like Facebook people, I'm getting really pain as I vibrate the wall. Shake, shake. So we're going to come off and we're going to dump. How long did I go? That's the next question, by the way, that somebody's going to ask. Uh, long enough to get the chocolate out, but not so long as my shoulder keeps big. Alright? Okay. Which which answer is that? Somebody couldn't hear. So I'm using a Sony one. It's the smallest of the Sony's. Um, it's a 10 kg machine. I've got three other temper units over there, uh, ranging size from 25 kilos, 35 kilos, and then there's another 10 kg machine over there as well. Um, they all work the same way. It's really about volume and output. The only, um, the small machines, the, this one's a one and the color, you can't put a rover on them. So, you know, if you need the rover, you gotta go to the Sony Plus. And apparently Kyle answered that question for me. So, thanks Kyle. Okay, so we're here. Now, this is one of those questions that we get asked a lot. Which way do I put this, do I put this mold on the marble? Do I put it this way? Or do I put it this way? Okay, I will tell you that when I learned how to do chocolate, it was this way. All right. Over time, I've graduated this way, all right? Because what I'm worried about is I'm worried about this edge. And I don't want there to be a build of chocolate on the edge. I want there to be a nice clean edge for when I go to pack, all right? So I put all my molds on the table that way. If I'm doing a lot of them, I'll get them up off the table usually using a couple of uh, ganache rulers or caramel rulers or ganache rings, right? Just to get them up so there's airflow so that we don't have a temper issue, all right? So, this mold we did, or I did, uh, a couple hours ago. I mean, new. So it's ready to get, it's ready to accept my, my filling. My filling's here. And it's at about 90 degrees. So, I'm going to risk it. Also, if we deposit our ganaches a little warmer, they stay softer. All right? Because the, the way that the curve attack crystallizes. So I like to, I like, I like to get my, my um, ganaches in the pieces a little smaller. So in my bag. Oh my gosh. Let's switch that down a little bit. A little twist. And now I'm here. I'm walking away again to cut this off over the trash can. One of those little ticks. Somehow these ticks end up everywhere. Try to cut them away, onto the floor, away from the Don't make the hole too big. 
Better to cut twice. Right. So now we're here. So Catherine's laughing. So I don't know if she's laughing about something somebody else said or I said. You never know. I'm right here. Got it. I know we're going to fill So only because I had the conversation earlier with somebody, I'm holding that bag, I've been holding a ball in my hand. That the tail is between my thumb and my palm, and I'm actually squeezing from here. I'm not squeezing with this hand. This hand is just a guy hand, all right? So squeeze, let go and up. The advantage to putting up like that is I don't drag my ganache on the top of my mold. Right, so I don't have to scrape that off. And more importantly, I don't compound it or chop it later when I go back into my bowl, whether I'm in my tempering unit or I'm in just a bowl. All right. So, Kathy just told me Chris is just doing. How are things at Pretty Gel? Things good in North Carolina? Warmer than they are probably here. We're having a frost warm tonight. Good times. So you probably can't see it too. The shape is a heart. So I'm actually starting. I'm starting on one side towards the bottom. As I'm filling, I'm pulling my I'm pulling my bag over to the other side so there's a nice little distribution throughout the entire piece without there being a hole or without there being a hole. So the question was, 90 degrees will not take the shells out of pepper. I also said I'm going a little early. But, right, there's some heat exchange going on. I don't want to go in at like 98, right, because that would definitely take my shells out of pepper. I'm going in a little warmer because what ends up happening is if, if I wait until like 87, by the time I finish, my ganache is at 84, 83, which is too firm, and I don't get a nice consistent finish. Um, Generally speaking, though, I find that the 90 is okay. My marble is really cold, too, right? So there's a, there's a bunch of heat exchange. Those pieces, the chocolate itself is at 70 degrees, right? So is it going to bring that chocolate back above 90? No? I mean, for the most part, no. But I, it is a good question that we want to be careful. We don't want to go in super hot, but at the same time, if we wait too long, then they're cold, and then we, get, we don't get a nice, clean top, okay? So, like, this ganache, okay, so this ganache is crystallized, right? It's really crystallized. You can see how shiny it is, right? That really ended at about 90 degrees, 89, something like that. When we started, it was that long, okay? So, cool. So, all I'm going to do is tap. So, this is sort of the same process we were doing before. We're going to put chocolate on, and we're going to scrape the chocolate off. Pretty straightforward. However, the same rules apply. I don't need as much chocolate now. I also want to try to get all the chocolate off on the, this side. And you can see that the side of the bowl are pretty clean. Right? That one not as clean. Also, when I'm doing a heart like this, I go from the small side to the big side. So, I'm not sure why. And you can't see it. When I'm doing this, I'm always putting a little bit of pressure, and it's at an angle, right? So I'm, I'm putting it along my molds like that. I'm not, like this, I'm also putting one side and then the other to keep my chocolate on the side. So I'll right back. So we're coming in, and you probably can't hear me, you definitely can't see me. I don't have a ton of chocolate on top of this. Somebody's asking about my scraper. Kyle? Kyle's going to put a link up to the scraper. So this scraper is actually from We Sell the Scraper. Okay. And this. Good. Thanks, Christy. So I didn't vibrate this, right? I didn't vibrate for a couple of reasons. One, there's not a lot of place for air bubbles to, to catch, and I forced my, my chocolate into my pieces. Right, so I don't have a problem. I also didn't vibrate because 
my chocolate is actually starting to crystallize pretty well, and I don't want to knock the pieces out of the bowls. If I'm ready to take it completely out. Okay, so we're done with the paper. I'm going to turn that off. I got way quieter in here. It's kind of nice. All right, this is now done in my fridge. Below, which is set at uh, 10 degrees Celsius, which is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is that temperature that I really like for chocolate crystallization. I stepped away, but I'm coming right back, I promise. I'm just grabbing this. And one of them there here things. We got a roll. But you really heard that. So close. So we have our pieces. Fold out. So that's our um, that's our finished piece, and you can you can really see the difference with that. I don't know, the difference between the side that has the black and the side that doesn't have the black. There's a, there's a big difference. These were pretty red, but I really like that finish. I like that finish to the whole piece. Um, in particular, you know, if we're doing something like the heart, it just gives a really it gives some depth to the piece without looking like they're overly colored. Um, so let's see what they look like on the inside. These are pretty cold, but uh, Catherine, can we can we see? Can we see what they did? They're pretty clean, huh? Um, a really straightforward dark chocolate piece. Um, taking up a little bit of all flavor from my rum. But other than that, pretty straightforward. Do I, so the question on Instagram, I, I read it. So the question on Instagram was, do I ever finish my pieces with acetate on the back? And it's become a really common thing. You get a really super, a super smooth uh, finish and a super shiny finish um, to avoid any of that. So that piece right there in particular, I don't know if you can see it, doesn't quite have the same, you know, flat back. It also allows them to be able to put transfer on the piece, so you can, you can logo it or you can do other things that indicate flavor. Um, do I do it? Do I do it? Sometimes. Do I do it a lot? No, but I'm also not selling pieces for sale, right? So um, I don't, I'm not really worried about it from, from where I'm standing up. From where I'm standing, it's not as important. Some things that you might want to keep in mind is about cost, right? So, you know, that acetate does have value. Transfer sheet does have value. It's going to add cost to your finished pieces. And is that, you know, is that where you want to spend those dollars? And that doesn't mean you don't want to spend those dollars there. Um, it just means it, it's extra dollars that you're spending, spending on something. So uh, that's my answer to that question. And I'm leaning over because I'm looking at comments. So how are we doing with time, Captain? Like, I flew through that. Like, I need to pray in 35 minutes. I'm going to have some water. 2.36. No questions. I can dance for a bit. I can like do my little group, like for a little bit, and see if there's anybody else who has any questions. So, so a couple things, a couple updates from us this week. Uh, our chocolate chat on Friday is going to be Kate Weiser from Dallas. So um, we're doing that on Friday, and then next week is Norman Love. You may have heard of him. He's kind of important in the chocolate industry. So one of the questions on here is, how often do you do demos? Um, personally, all the time. How often do you do here on Facebook? We do them every Tuesday. Um, we do them at 2 o'clock on Tuesdays, and we do our Chocolate Care Chat on Fridays, where we talk to some, some movers and shakers in the industry. So like I was saying, um, we're talking to Kate Weiser this week. We're talking to Norman Love next week. The week after that, we're talking to Robin Dotson from St. Croix Chocolate Company. 
in the Marine Monsink Corner of Soda. He's a good friend and I think he's doing some of the finest chocolate, really flavor-wise, he's doing some really awesome stuff. Not that the other people that I mentioned aren't doing great product. Um, and uh, Carrie Beal, who I name I dropped earlier, you know, because I was talking about the easy temper. So when I drop her name, it's okay. Um, it's called me a name dropper. Uh, we're, so anyway, those are the three next weeks, and then I think we're actually going to do an international edition when we get into June. I gotta arrange that. We gotta figure out the time zones thing, because two o'clock in the afternoon is not a good time for people from Australia. So we're gonna, I think we're gonna try to come to some different. And Catherine says we got another question. So she's gonna read me the question. Okay, so how long would it take? It's, it's a question of how many created. So the question is how long does it take to make from start to finish? Um, it's number of pieces you need to make, right? So for example, these shells that I did 10 minutes ago are ready to be filled. Okay, and it took me about 30 seconds to fill them, right? So the airbrushing, probably took me a minute a piece, right? If I was working in sequence, I would have done red, black, white. So let's say it takes a minute total, 20 seconds each application. So one minute. This took 30 seconds. So Catherine asked me a question, I'm gonna get to that in a second, because I don't know what she said, I was only kind of so, the next, so shell molding is going to take about uh, 30 seconds, so we're in a minute and a half. Filling them with ganache took, let's say, a minute, so we're at two and a half minutes, and capping takes, let's say, it's another minute. So, the process is three and a half minutes of mold. Right, but we have to time that out in sequence so that it makes sense. Right, so in theory, that means three minutes, three goes into 60, 20. I can do 20 molds an hour. I probably can go a little faster than that than sell me. Just when we're really cranking. Like I can do, I can shell like 100 molds an hour, but that doesn't matter, right? So if I can do, let's call it 25 molds an hour, right? But it's about sequencing it out so that it works. Right, so 25 times 60, like 1,200 pieces a day, ish, somewhere in that number. But that, but that, that depends on number of molds, how many you want to do of any one piece, right? If I'm doing one piece all day, you know, I'm doing my dark chocolate ganache, that number is way up. Um, so Catherine's question to me was about can we do something else? And yeah, we definitely can. Why don't we do some hand dipping and some enrobing next Tuesday? That sounds like fun. So we'll break out the rover and we'll uh, we'll hand dip some first. And we'll do some decorating techniques, some finishing techniques on hand dip or in robe, and we'll show that process. So we'll just we'll just talk about robing mostly. Um, maybe we'll cut on the guitar too, because I've been cutting on the guitar in probably six or eight weeks on this on Tuesdays. Hey, um, Tyler, let's. I think that's Tyler. Let's talk about that off the line. Send me a text and we'll talk about it. Cool. Just because it would be fun to talk off the line. But yeah, feel free. You know, you don't email Jesse, just email me. Hey, so um, back to Friday, Chocolate Chit Chat, only available on Instagram. Sorry, I'm going to be taking on the app. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, but, uh, you know, so click on over to Conrad Systems Instagram page and like us. We're dangerously close to 2,000 likes, which is the first one all. Um, and then you can watch us on Tuesday, or Friday there, and then we'll uh, we'll do some enrobing on Tuesday, and uh, we'll talk to uh, Norman Love next Friday. And I think that's it. And um, I don't see any other questions. Catherine, do you see any other questions? She was. Cool. Hi Cynthia, Tyler, I'm Brad Richley, and I uh, appreciate everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. And Kyle's going to that everything ends up on YouTube. 
So our YouTube page is like getting full of lots of jam packed information, ranging from you know how do you use different pieces of equipment to demos to me talking to some of the cool cats in the industry. I won't mention their names again because because Carrie will say something bad about me. But anyway, thanks all. Have a uh,